Hello, everyone. It's just after 5 p.m. Um, and I'm going to give folks just one more minute, maybe, uh, as we gather here on Zoom for a very special panel. Um, I want to welcome everyone as, uh, as we filter in to the Hood College Department of Political Science virtual panel on parties, policy, and the people, U.S. politics in 2021. Should I go ahead and get started, Karen? All right. Um, well, then we will get started now. And my name is Katie. I'm a new assistant professor in the department. I'm thrilled to be moderating this virtual event for our campus community and beyond. To our attendees, thank you for being here. And please type your questions in the Q&A um, when we'll get to them after the panelists have each given their remarks. For this panel, my distinguished colleagues from the department will draw on their areas of expertise in political science. Uh, they each also give courses in these areas for students out there who may be interested. Uh, and their comments uh, will be about what has changed and what hasn't changed following the 2020 general presidential election and start of a new US administration. As we all know, the 2020 election was unusual to say the least, it took place during a pandemic and amid massive social movements for gender and racial justice like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. The election saw record-breaking turnout and the first woman as well as person of color become vice president. The election process itself was disrupted by an insurrection on January 6th by supporters of a president who afterward became the only one in US history to have been impeached twice. And these unusual conditions of life in a pandemic and amid social unrest continue on even now with the events uh, ongoing in Atlanta, Georgia. All these days after the election results confirmed uh, the victory of a Biden administration. So we're here to think about what really has and hasn't changed at this point. And to start us off with a look at foreign policy, I'll ask Dr. Paige Eager, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for Global Studies at Hood College to lead the way. Okay, well, thank you very much for that warm introduction, Katie. And Again, thank you for all of you for being here today. So as Katie said, um, my area of expertise within political science is um, international relations and comparative politics. But I do teach a class on US foreign policy that um, some students took just last fall. So in that class, of course, we were thinking already a lot about what uh, might change or what might not, or what might stay the same. Um, if Trump had won a second term in office versus um, an incoming Biden-Harris administration. So I'm just going to provide some really general um, remarks tonight. And then, like I said, hopefully after all the other presenters go, we can have some uh, Q&A. So Biden has probably one of the more impressive, I guess you could say, backgrounds in foreign policy uh, for an incoming president. I mean, besides the fact that he was Obama's vice president um, for eight years. He also served in the Senate on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as the chair or ranking minority member for, for decades, um, along with the Senate Judiciary Committee. So he knows, of course, already a lot of world leaders um, during his time in the Senate and or obviously as vice president. Biden's team, of course, is still um, shaping up. Another confirmation uh, just came in a few minutes ago for the CIA directorship. Um, who's now going to be William Burns, who actually was over in the State Department uh, as a Deputy Secretary of State previously in Obama's administration. But these are just some of the key players. Many of them are from the Obama administration as well, uh, which makes sense. Um, that's, you know, some familiar faces. So the folks who've already been confirmed include Anthony Blinken, who's Secretary of State, uh, Jake Sullivan, who's National Security Advisor, uh, General Lloyd Austin as Secretary of Defense, Avril Hames, who's the Director of National Intelligence now, and then Lisa Thomas-Greenfield, who's the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Um, and a lot of these folks, of course, have cabinet rank uh, within the Biden administration. And of course, also just today on Thursday, um, there was a meeting between some of these folks and their Chinese counterparts. 
um, in Anchorage, Alaska. So obviously we'll be talking a little bit here in a minute about what might change or what might stay the same as far as US foreign policy uh, towards China. So um, moving forward with our next slide here. Oh, and John Kerry, I forgot to mention him as well. He's the so-called climate czar um, for climate change issues. So some of the issues that you know have been very quickly changed since Biden's administration came into office um, is really uh, uh, joining or rejoining, I should say, a lot of agreements and organizations that the Trump administration had withdrawn from. Um, so just to give us a few examples, we have the Paris Climate Accord, which President Trump withdrew the United States from uh, back in 2017. The United States has already rejoined the Human Rights Council at the United Nations as an observer state. Um, and I assume we'll try to run for a seat on that council the next time there's an election for that body within the UN. Obviously, the World Health Organization, as we all know, has been front and center living through a global pandemic. So we are now um, rejoining that organization and continuing to support it with financing and expertise. Uh, European Union and U.S. relations have also certainly uh, rebounded somewhat. I mean, that's not to say that Trump did not have some good relations with some European Union leaders, but some of the countries that are often seen as the leaders of the EU, especially Germany and France, um, I'm, think, I'm thinking we're probably a little bit happier with the Biden administration in office uh, than they were with the Trump administration. Of course, Angela Merkel, she's in her last few months as Chancellor of Germany, uh, and then France will be facing presidential elections next year in 2022. Uh, Yemen is also another interesting case where the Trump administration had been really continuing a policy of the Obama administration as far as helping to support um, the Saudi government's role in this really complex civil war that's been playing out in Yemen for the past five to six years. However, there were increasing reports of grave human rights abuses and war crimes potentially being committed uh, by Saudi-backed forces, courtesy of some US military weapons that were being sold to the Saudis. Um, so the United States has basically uh, withdrawn that support. And Congress did try to stop uh, some US arms sales to Saudi Arabia because of this very issue during Trump's administration. Uh, but Trump actually overrode that um, congressional legislation with a presidential veto. Um, so we are seeing, like I said, a change at least in our US policy towards Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis -vis Yemen uh, with the Biden administration. And then, of course, I know many of you are aware of Alexei Navalny, who's kind of the face now of Russian opposition um, in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Um, of course, he was almost poisoned to death uh, with a very, very high grade nerve agent, um, but did survive, recovered in Germany, and now has returned back to Russia. And of course, he has already now been sentenced and sent to a penal colony, um, a very harsh Russian penal colony. Uh, for at least two years. And so the United States has already responded uh, to that development in Russia with imposing more sanctions on particular Russian officials, not Vladimir Putin himself, uh, but certainly other high ranking members within Putin's government. Um, so that's again, a, a fairly significant change from what we saw with the outgoing Trump administration. Because Alexei Navalny has been around for a while. It's not like he all of a sudden just arose on the scene in the past few weeks or few months. Um, as far as my prediction about what won't change all that much is actually U.S. policy towards China. Um, obviously, Vice President Biden previously had gotten to know the president of China, President Xi Jinping, uh, quite well. Um, and of course, many international relations scholars argue that the relationship between the United States and China is probably going to really shape the future of the next 80 years, really, for the remainder of this century. Um, so even though the tone perhaps has changed somewhat on China uh, with the Biden administration, I don't think a lot of the policies will really significantly change that much. Um, some examples, for instance, I think the Biden administration will still continue on with tariffs um, against Chinese imports coming into the United States, perhaps not at the tariff rate that they're currently being um, taxed at, uh, but I assume tariffs will still be part of a Biden uh, foreign policy strategy. Um, the United States still has a lot of concerns about Chinese military action in the South China Sea. 
Um, and again, this is an ongoing issue going back to even the Biden or the, um, excuse me, the Bush administration, Bush Jr. that is. Um, so I expect to see still, you know, not a lot of um, resolved conflict or the potential for resolved conflict in the South China Sea region, where you have about six countries that all claim territorial waters within the South China Sea. Taiwan, of course, remains an ally in many ways of the United States. Um, of course, Taiwan has handled the COVID pandemic quite well um, in comparison to many other countries. Uh, President uh, Trump did certainly send over some high ranking officials to visit Taiwan right towards the very end of his administration. Um, and that, of course, always angers China uh, whenever US officials actually go to visit Taiwan in person. Uh, but I do expect the United States to still maintain our military um, guarantee to Taiwan um, in the event that there should be an attack by mainland China against Taiwan sovereignty. Hong Kong, uh, the United States has already also put increased sanctions on some Chinese officials seen as uh, responsible for uh, more repression against Hong Kong uh, pro-democracy activists, many of whom, of course, have now been um, imprisoned. And also, of course, towards the tail end of Trump's administration, um, President or Secretary of State at the time, Mike Pompeo, um, actually labeled what the Chinese are doing against the Chinese Muslims known as Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province as genocide. Um, and so President Biden has also labeled what is happening against the Uyghurs as genocide as well. Um, whether that will result in any kind of significant um, developments as far as our policy towards China on the Uyghurs um, that still remains to be seen. But again, that's another area of consistency between the Bi or between the Trump and the Biden administration. But like I said, you know, perhaps we'll see a different tone, but I think a lot of the policy um, um, changes or policies won't change basically between the Trump and Biden folks. And then finally, just three issues that are still very much up in the air to kind of see if there will be continuity or a drastic change from Trump to Biden's foreign policy team. Um, there's still not a lot of clarity about what's going to happen with the future of the Iran nuclear agreement, also known as the Joint Comprehensive Program um, of Action. Um, and again, this Iran nuclear deal was negotiated towards the tail end of the Obama administration in 2015. Uh, President Trump formally pulled the United States out of the agreement, which left the other state parties still um, you know, in the agreement. Uh, but Iran also has elections, presidential elections coming up this June. Um, so that also might be kind of a wait and see approach to see who the next president of Iran will be about what position the Biden will take, um, administration will take about rejoining the agreement. North Korea, of course, is always a wild card. Uh, very, uh, very radic, um, obviously, political leadership there. Um, all the past administrations going back to Clinton have tried different um, roads of negotiations with the North Koreans. Um, without very much um, substantive results of those negotiations. So I would say that's still a bit of a wild card to see um, if Biden will be able to move the, the ball, so to speak, any more forward about a lasting uh, resolution to the North Korea situation. And then finally, uh, May 1st is the date that Trump had set to withdraw the remaining US troops from Afghanistan. Uh, Biden, of course, has ordered his team to obviously look at this and prioritize this as a major issue that needs some kind of um, decision on uh, very quickly. And so we expect to see, like I said, an announcement, I would assume, from the Biden administration in the next few weeks about whether, in fact, the May 1st deadline will be upheld um, or if those troops will remain in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. So those are my remarks and I will go ahead and stop talking. Thank you so much, Dr. Eager, and for drawing our attention to this really interesting um, dichotomy between tone and policy. I hope folks out there might have some questions and just a reminder to attendees to post your questions in the Q&A, which we'll get to after all of our panelists have given their remarks. So next up, we have Dr. Karen Robinson, Associate Professor of Political Science, who will talk to us about the state of US political parties.
Karen, you're on mute. I really appreciate that. Um, and I was speaking so well for the past 30 seconds, but I'll start again. Um, political parties in 2021, what has changed and what remains the same? And to help structure my remarks, I'm going to use VO Key's three levels of political parties. Party in the electorate, meaning the voters, party as an organization, and party in government. Clearly, political parties, it's a multi-dimensional term, and so this will help us organize what are we talking about when we talk about a party. So first, party in the electorate. As voters, um, party ID remains the single best predictor of vote choice. If I want to know who you're going to vote for, I could simply ask, which party do you like more? Which party do you identify with? Even if you're an independent, which way do you lean? And that is the consistently best predictor of how you're going to vote. There was no mass exodus of moderate Republican voters, as some suspected. Even though columnists in the Washington Post, columnists in the New York, New York Times um, wrote in, in very negative ways of, of Trump's tenure, um, we did not see that in the masses. If you look at the exit polls, the majority of Republicans voted for Trump, the majority of Democrats voted for Biden. Um, remarkably, 5% of 5% of um, those that identified as Democrats voted for Trump. And we see a similar distribution amongst the independents. Um, they lean Democrat, there's a pocket of Republicans. And so this doesn't look much different than it did four years ago. So this is the aspect that really hasn't changed at the aggregate level. However, if we look within the GOP voters, um, we see a significant a number of them that really define their partisanship in terms of allegiance to Trump. Um, and so this is the question mark for the future. In this survey, if Donald Trump were to start a new political party, such as the MAGA party or the Patriot party, how likely would you be to join? 64% of respondents said that they would support that. Now this is hypothetical and, and if this were to occur, would they really go? It remains to be seen. Um, but it's remarkable that these individuals have come to identify themselves as, as, as a follower of a candidate as opposed to a party. And we just haven't seen that kind of dynamic in recent presidential elections. A recent poll that was done just among those that identified themselves as MAGA supporters, Make America Great Again, shows the distinctiveness of their opinions, um, their belief in the that the election results were fraud, um, that voting shouldn't be easier, that there should be a third term for Trump. Um, there's remarkable um, homogeneity amongst their opinions and amongst this population. This population uh, fears that Americans are losing their freedom, um, that there are secret plots, that the, our, their way of life is disappearing. Unknown actors are making decisions. Forces are changing our country for the worse. And these, this is a real distinct collective um, set of opinions that are different from more moderate Republicans and, and vastly different from Democrats. And so what this produces amongst the Republican party is something that many social scientists are curious about. And it's something that again is new and different and is a change for the Republican party. While there's much to be said about the Democratic Party on this front, I'm gonna to stick to just speaking to the fact that there is a distinct base within the GOP um, that has a lot of control over what this party looks like moving forward. And that is something that has changed. Shifting now to party as an organization. Um, we only have two parties in the United States and we think that's just how it is, um, but there are many forces that brought about that that make it very unique relative to other developed democracies. Um, and regardless of your opinion, whether it's good or bad, it's going to stay the same. Um, there are many laws in place, structures in place that perpetuate our two party system. And again, many people thought that because of the figure of President Trump and his following that we would see a third organization arise. Like I showed you earlier, there is a base of of GOP supporters that would, would move in that direction. Uh, but uh, former President Trump himself has said that's not his plan. Um, as he attended the CPAC conference just uh, weeks ago, said that that's not his plan and he's gonna remain a Republican. And so not only his 
uh, remarks, but also just the structure of our country and the laws in place, there is no real potential for a third major party. Uh, so that is something that is very much staying the same for the foreseeable future. But something that is changing, I think, is the organization of the GOP um, and what it represents and what it plat its platform is about. Uh, remarkably, in the 2020, um, the GOP um, platform, there, there was no distinct policy agenda. It simply said what President Trump stands for is what the GOP stands for. And that is unusual and that is new. Um, typically, there's been three you know, uh, legs of this party, fiscal, social, foreign policy conservatives. Um, now we see a new energy emerging that's really based on kind of culture wars, but of a different kind, not social policy, but more um, opposition to this cancel culture that they're um, uh, arguing with. I, I thought it was quite notable. Um, ben Sass, a Republican Senator from Nebraska who voted in favor of conviction, um, opposed his party's president, presidential um, candidate in uh, a video that he posted on the day that his state's Republican party was going to vote to censure him for his vote in favor of conviction. He uh, was, was quite explicit in saying that his party has descended into the weird worship of one dude. Um, and there's some accuracy there in, in our attempts to explain the nature of this party. One consultant said the party is about owning the libs on Twitter. It's about dunking on the left. It's about picking fights that you get on cable news. And so as a social scientist, I'm curious, is attacking cancel culture and woke people, is this a successful political strategy? There have been culture wars, but those have primarily been over policy matters, having to do with abortion, having to do with LGBTQ rights. Um, this, is, this is a new set of, of culture wars that we're seeing. This is a culture wars that deals with Dr. Seuss. Republican voters were more likely to hear a lot about Dr. the Dr. Seuss decision than any other news event during uh, this particular three-day time frame. Um, so as you may have heard, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, the family, uh, decided to pull six of its books because they included racist imagery. They chose to do this. Nobody was canceling Dr. Seuss. Um, however, the framing of it amongst conservative news outlets was that it was cancel culture run amok. And they, uh, Republican voters were more likely to hear about that news item than the COVID relief bill, than the fact that former President Trump was getting the vaccine and various other news events. So this table speaks to our media landscape and how divided it is and, and how they prioritize certain things over others. Um, but it also speaks to the magnetic appeal of some of these cultural cancel culture conversations are to certain segments of, of the Republican base and, and, and the threat that they do feel about, that, about their values being infringed upon. Party as an organization, in sum, um, there's uncertainty about the agenda, the leadership, huge question mark, who comes after President Trump as a leader of the Republican Party. And I did wanna highlight nine out of the 10 Republicans in the House who voted for impeachment, they already face primary challengers for their 2022 races. Finally, party and government. What is still the same, we will continue to have party line voting and gridlock. I love this chart. It highlights the um, voting patterns in Congress since 1949. Um, each blob there is a particular Congress and the blue dots represent um, members of Congress who are Democrat, the red dots, members who are Republican. And you can see in the top left, there's lots of lines connecting those dots. And that signifies them voting with people across the aisle. And you can see as time moves forward, down in the bottom right, you see great distinction. Republicans voted with Republicans, Democrats voted with Democrats, and there was no lines crossing the aisle. Um, this is here to stay. Even, even uh, Sass from Nebraska um, voted with Trump 90 something percent of the time, even if he disapproves of, of various aspects of, of his leadership. This isn't going anywhere. And I think if anything, unlike the electorate and the organization, I think the conversation when it comes to political parties in government is primarily gonna be about the Democratic Party. Um, here is an interesting uh, illustration of the second impeachment vote 
Um, and we see here all the senators uh, represented. And you see on the left hand, the, the margins there represent Trump's vote in the senator's state. And so you can see the blue dots represent the Democratic senators. And the majority of them live in states in which Trump received less than 50% of the vote in the 2020 election. And so their vote was, was consistent with their constituency. And you see the majority of Republicans vote in states where he received more than 50% of the vote. You see the middle darker reds, and those are the people who voted in favor of conviction. Some of them went against the, their state population. But the person who was, was almost the most inconsistent with what their state aligned with was Joe Manchin in West Virginia. I think Joe Manchin is going to be the story when it comes to parties in government, parties in Congress. The extent to which the Democratic Party can make him happy is critical for their success in, in their agenda because they do not have, they have a bare majority, they have a tie. Um, they need Vice uh, President Harris's vote um, to break that tie and they need Joe Manchin to make it a tie. And so I think oddly enough, while we're gonna be talking about Republicans in, in many contexts, I think when we're talking about legislation and what's actually happening, it's gonna be a story about the Democratic Party and their ability to coalesce and to merge the interests of their moderates and the progressives. Um, typically it is the party that controls both chambers in Congress and the right house that receives the scrutiny more so than the minority party, which does not have to, um, to coalesce as, as quickly as, as, as the one in the bare majority. So in sum, um, I have my points here. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of continuity because the constitution is such, our country is such that things don't change all that quickly around here. Um, but I think there's some really interesting questions to be explored when it comes to the future of the Republican party, its electorate, what coalitions exist there, um, as well as what the Democratic party can do while they have the power because it might be short-lived um, the nature of our elections, redistricting, many, many factors are in play that, that give the Republican Party a chance to win back at least one chamber um, in a year or two. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, and for that helpful framework from VO Key of thinking about parties in terms of the electorate organization and in government. Um, so with that, we will turn to our next uh, speaker. Dr. Tamlin tucker Warps is chair of the political science department and associate professor of political science and African American studies. Dr. tucker Warps will comment on voting rights and turnout. Hi, thanks. Thank you, um, Dr. Robidek, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. And also thank you to the uh, to my colleagues and panelists. I'm I'm excited to be here and to talk with you about some of these issues. I'm going to be very quick. Um, I'm focusing on the 2020 elections. Dr. Robinson gave us this theme: what changed, what stayed the same. And I kept thinking these things change. No, they stay the same. I kept putting them in different categories. So we'll see um, if they really fit um, these ideas. I came up with more. Or change change items then stay the same um, but we'll we'll see so we've talked about this election season and the election of 2020 it was like no other um, you know we were voting during a pandemic um, but despite that we had record turnout um, two-thirds of eligible voters turned out in this election that's what estimates are over 154 million uh, million votes were cast. Um, and so I want to talk about what changed this record. First, I want to talk about this record voter turnout. Voter turnout increased in every state in the United States um, compared to 2016. Um, and so if you look at this, this graphic from Pew, um, it shows that and it shows that uh, the, these uh, uh, states with the boxes around them, the, the solid boxes are states that where this votes were cast mostly or all by vote by mail um, in 2020. But you can look at it and see that all of these states um, increased in their voter turnout, um, you know, from 2%, 2.2 or something like that percent all the way to like 14%. And so this is, this is quite remarkable, I think, and an important change, shift. Now, 
again, change stays the same. We don't know how what will happen, you know, in the in the next election cycle. But at least from 2016 to 2020, we saw this increase increase in voter turnout. Um, and so we also saw these new voter um, mechanisms or ways that people voted, mostly sparked by the pandemic that encouraged the voter turnout. So for example, this is a picture in Texas. Texas, I'm from Houston, we love a good drive through. And so one of the things that Texas did, not Texas, but Houston, Harris County, because um, of the uh, leadership there in Harris County um, had curbside voting or drive-through voting where voters were able to drive through, not get out of their car, be handed a tablet um, and to vote on the tablet safely and in their cars with their masks. And so this was a great help to increase voter turnout or, or to allow people to vote um, in Harris County. This was a, um, a policy that was um, challenged several times by the uh, Texas Republican Party, but was not, you know, they still were able to um, to vote by curbside or drive-through voting. Also, we saw an increase in no excuse absentee voting or mail-in voting um, like we had here in Maryland and also expanded early voting. So these were some of the, some of the techniques that were used to um, allow people to vote safely during the pandemic, um, some of which we hadn't seen before. Okay, we also had some firsts. Here we have our Madam Vice President, Kamala Harris, um, who said um, after they won, while I may be the first woman elected to this office, I will not be the last. So we hear, we see here another crack in that, what Hillary Clinton called that hardest, highest glass ceiling uh, with uh, someone elected, elected to executive office who is a woman who's of African descent, who's also of Indian descent and who's a child of immigrants, Kamala Harris. Um, she was she had been a senator, so she left her Senate seat in order to be vice president. So we also see, on the other hand, the um, the Senate the uh, not uh, we no longer have a black woman senator where we had one who was Kamala Harris. Now there are zero. So we know we have a long way to go as far as parity is concerned um, when it comes to elective office, especially those high level elective offices. We also had some other firsts, and I. Uh, in Georgia. Georgia played an important role in the elections of 2020 and the presidential election. Also, Georgia elected two senators who were first, um, Senator John Ossoff, who was the who is a Jewish and who's the first Jewish senator to be elected from the state of Georgia, and also Reverend Raphael Warnock, who um, became the first Black person elected from the state of Georgia and the office of as senator. Um, both of them won in runoff elections, which also broke another record. The runoff election was, um, I think I think there were four, over almost 5 million people who voted in the runoff election, almost the same number who voted in the general election, which is really unheard of to have such a high turnout um, in, this, in this runoff election. But it was a very competitive election. And so now we have these two senators um, who are elected to to office? This wasn't magic. This, you know, it didn't happen by magic that the um, that Georgia and also Georgia um, went blue for in the presidential election. And so now some are calling Georgia maybe purple, right? Um, so Georgia um, voted for um, ele uh, electoral college votes went to. Uh, President Biden. And so all of this happened because of hard work um, and organizing on the ground. So this is Stacey Abrams. She was one of the important workers, one of, uh, we've been, you know, saying a lot about Stacey Abrams and I, she's very important, but she wasn't the only one who worked hard to organize and mobilize voters in Georgia. Stacey Abrams ran a very competitive race for governor in 2018. She lost the race. It's kind of controversial. Some say the race was stolen from her. Um, but however, she didn't stop and sulk, and maybe she did that, but she also got to work. And she um, mobilized, helped to mobilize voters through her organization, Fair Fight, um, that, and, and mobilized thousands of voters. Um, and registered first time voters, registered them and, and they voted and they turned out. Um, and so it wasn't by magic. This is not really new, I mean, a change, but 
because but I think it, it's a change and that they they were successful and that um, we are kind of recognizing the work of these grassroots people. Okay, another something that I thought was a change was this idea, this assumption that people would accept the validity uh, or the legitimacy of our elections here in the United States. So we know that we had this, um, you know, that we had, you know, lots of people who did not, who thought, who kind of thought that the, or think that the election was stolen, that Joe Biden didn't win fair and square, um, and that, you know, they kind of uh, push this stop the steal um, campaign that resulted as the, you know, the highlight of it or the low light was the storming of the Capitol, right, on January 6th. And so um, not only that, um, there was an attempt to throw out the votes of, of millions of voters um, in Philadelphia, in Georgia, in Wisconsin, and to say that their votes, um, you know, weren't valid. Um, and so we see, and this all kind of culminates from this um, denial of the legitimacy of the uh, election outcomes. We also have seen, and are seeing, um, you know, local state laws and local laws being pursued over 250 to restrict voting um, under this idea of secure the vote. Um, and and there, uh, like in Georgia, it's notorious for a lot of the uh, pieces of legislation trying to pass at the state level, like not giving water to some of the you know ones that have been getting attention, not giving water to people who are standing in line waiting to vote. That that would be a crime or against policy, or um, you know shortening early vote voting, um, early voting times when you can do early voting. Um, or requiring people to make a copy of their ID to do any absentee or mail-in voting, or not allowing no excuse um, absentee or mail-in voting. So those are some of the pieces of legislation designed to protect the vote or stop the stop the steal um, and to curb what they're considering voter fraud. Okay, so, so some things that remain the same. Um, the gender gap. So the gender gap persists. So when you look at the gender gap um, in voting, the gender gap refers to the difference in the percentage of women and, and the percentage of men voting for a particular for a given candidate. That's one way of thinking about the gender gap we're talking about right here in presidential elections. So if you look here, this is all 2020 except for that very last row. But when you look here, you see that overall 45% um, of um, uh, men voted for Biden, 57% um, of women voted for Biden, um, and this is, these are the overall numbers, 53% of men voted for Trump, um, um, and 42% of women voted for Trump, and so that's a 12-point gender gap, um, but as I, uh, but I also want to point out that that gender gap is, is pushed or is, it's made larger, um, uh, by when you look at race, you see that, you know, that gender gap looks different. So if you look at white voters, there's still a gender gap, but most white voters voted for Trump and most white women voted for Trump, even though there's still a gender gap. And so we'll see that 55%, I think in 2016, it was 52% women voting for, voting for Trump. And so we, while we still have a gender gap, um, the gen well, we still have a gender gap. It looks the same. It looks pretty much the same as 20 as 2016. So that's what I want to point out here. Um, you see a gender gap acro across these different uh, racial groups, white voters, black voters, Latinx voters, except for Asian American voters. I don't think I saw this in 2016, this number, but there was really not a gender gap in 2020. And I didn't, I didn't see what it was in 2016, um, but that would be interesting to go back and look. Okay, another thing that persists, and this is why I'm saying, Okay, I kind of said it, it was different, but now I say the same. But this grassroots, um, you know, organizing is something that we see, we, we saw, we've seen before 2020. When 2020, we kind of saw it come to fruition. But like I said, the, the, um, uh, the, the high voter turnout was not a result of magic. This is a picture of Latasha Brown. And she started, she, along with others, started this organization, Black Voters Matter fund in 2016. And so they've been organizing and registering new voters and um, working to expand voting options since 2016, um, at least since then. And so um, I just wanted to point out the kind of 
the hit the tradition of and the history of um you know grassroots organizing and mobilizing voters um and also latasha brown as this black woman i just also wanted to emphasize this uh, this also stays the same this loyal um this most loyal kind of uh, democratic voter uh, in Black women, and also worker to organize voters. Okay, and finally, um, what stayed the same, I, I wanted to talk about just very briefly about Black churches. Black churches, um, along with other institutions and organizations, had to uh, shut down during um, the COVID crisis. So their doors aren't physically open, the vast majority of them. They haven't started back in-person services. And one of the kind of um, kind of roles they have played in, um, in elections has is, is been to kind of get out the vote, to do voter education, voter registration. And also since the advent of early voting, something called souls to the polls where people will you know go to church on sunday and if there's an early voting day on on sunday all go to the voting site together and vote and so um i wanted to say that even though they were um kind of uh there was a challenge because of the shutdown they weren't meeting physically they still did a lot of work um to try to get out the vote in 2020. Um, and so I did a survey of about 250 Black churches, mostly in Maryland, but some in other places um, across the country. And 96% of them said they had some done some election work during the during 2020. So maybe it would might some of it was like just talking about voting, encouraging people to vote, you know, from the pulpit in their virtual services, but others included still doing souls to the polls um, or, you know, and still gathering, but take, but keeping in mind that they needed to stay social distance and wear masks. So working with the, um, you know, the safety protocols, but still emphasizing um, get, get out the vote efforts. Some even, I know in Maryland, even served as, you know, even, um, sponsored hotlines to help people to register and vote um, and also to um, request their mail-in ballots, uh, people who couldn't, you know, who were having trouble figuring out how to do that. So they still serve as community resources to try to get out the vote. And then the other day, Reverend Raphael Warnock, um, Senator Warnock, this might've been yesterday, um, he, he was talking about, he was, talking in support of the For the People Act, um, which is which they're trying to expand voting rights. And he said a lot of things. So one of the things he said was that a vote is a prayer. I thought that was really interesting. And he taught he said that, you know, voting is um for him, voting is talking about, is 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 reflecting on how we want the world to be. Um, and so I thought this was an interesting kind of um uh, kind of introduction to some traditions in Black Christian thought that connect citizenship with um, with uh, with voting and citizenship rights. And so that's something that I don't think is different. I think it, stayed, it has stayed the same. It's like a tradition that is being introduced to a wider audience. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tucker Works, for um, your wonderful overview of voting rights and turnout, and also bringing up this philosophical question of what is what is change? <laughs> is it something that that permanently uh, is in a new figuration, or something that um, is ephemeral? So, um, bringing up that really important philosophical question, and I'll just. Um, kick off the Q&A um, by encouraging folks to uh, put questions and comments into the Q&A for our esteemed panelists. And I will go first with my question about something that came up in comments um, in terms of the media landscape um, for this election pre and post. Um, was there any way in which the media landscape seems to have changed platforms that were used, campaigns use of, of media or social media in ways that you think are going to cease or continue continue for any one of you. What was I'll, I'll unmute myself and, and take a stab at it. Um, right, we don't exactly know 
to what extent the landscape is a function of the pandemic or a new approach in campaign strategy. And, and I think it's gonna take a cycle or two post pandemic to see the effect of the pandemic on the nature of campaigning and elections. I think in terms of shaping our electorate and shaping opinions, clearly we've seen a trajectory to more um, this, the silo approach to information distribution where we have a more partisan landscape we have a media that's primarily run by as, as a business model, a marketplace, as opposed to um, a, a fourth branch of government that is doing its purpose of informing voters and, and holding government accountable. Uh, so I think, I think the questions that we do need to ask are, to what extent did the pandemic, it had, did it have a permanent effect on how we see communication happening? Um, clearly, we didn't have in-person campaigning this election cycle. And so I think that um, will alter our impression of things as it stands now. Those are my thoughts. Tamlin, did you wanna chime in? Okay, I saw a few questions regarding partisanship that I was gonna take a stab at. Um, one question pertained to the divide between Republicans and Democrats and another one spoke to the polarization and the presence of rhinos and dinos. And so um, first, what divides the parties today? So interestingly enough, um, the hope would be that we are all uh, very informed voters and we weigh the issues and we vote for the party that we think has our best interest in mind or the best interest of the country. Um, but cities really find that our partisanship is largely a psychological and sociological phenomenon. Um, I am of one party like I am a fan of the Green Bay Packers. It's because I'm part of a team. And so we have seen this team mentality kind of overtake any kind of cognitive calculation that's being done on the part of voters. And so what defines and divides us is not really that I disagree with you on foreign or economic policy. It's that I might have been raised in one type of home and you were raised in a different type of home, in a different region, in a different type of school. And culturally, we have been shaped by different forces. That said, I don't wanna minimize policy distinctions because they're very much in play and, and we very well may disagree on a policy issue, but it's just accompanied by a whole web of feelings and emotion and teammanship. And that has, has in, increased polarization and, and getting to the second question, presence of rhinos, Republicans in name only in, in Congress or dinos, Democrats in name only, Though that used to be a common phenomenon in, in which we had a lot of moderates on both sides of the aisle that would cross parties to, to vote um, in, in ways that we don't see today. And so um, the, the diminishing number of rhinos and dinos is a function of, of the cultural landscape, but it's also a function of redistricting. Dr law, lines are drawn in such partisan ways uh, that it's very difficult for a moderate to win in a House race. Um, we see them emerge in Senate races on occasion, and we saw that in the vote, um, the second impeachment vote in the Senate this time around with a number of those may, I, I wouldn't go so far to call them rhinos by any stretch, but Murkowski from Alaska and Collins in Maine, um, they on occasion vote for, for uh, with the Democrats. But uh, because of redistricting, we don't see that in the House, and because of just the party composition and the trajectory that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years around cultural issues, we just don't see them very often. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to go to Kim's question. She's asking about a comparison of other religious communities, religions and religious communities and election work. And I, I, I will say that some of the work I, 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 I may have casted as um, it's, it's really um, work that happens among various religious groups. So particularly in Milwaukee, um, the Souls to the Poles effort um, is one that was not only um, it was led by black, a black Christian minister, but it was not only one of the black church. There were lots of different um, kind of religious traditions that were represented in that souls to the pulse effort. However, it was, um, you know, mostly led by progressive or left-leaning groups. 
And so I will say that um, about, and I'll also say that, um, you know, for the African, for the black churches and the black kind of religious um, uh, kind of push towards voting, they're seeing voting as a part of, uh, a, as a moral issue. It's very interesting, as well as a religious one. They're kind of connecting citizenship and, um, and, and, and their religious views, the gospel, which I'm not sure if that's seen in the same way as other, in other religious traditions. Karen, you might want to say something like that. I don't know if you do. Don't feel compelled. Um, so as some of you know, I study the white evangelical community and it's just remarkable the extent to which um, 80% of those that identified as evangelical voted for Trump, um, but the 10 to 20% that did not vote for Trump um, were fairly outspoken. And there have been denominations that have essentially kicked people out for their lack of endorsement of Trump or the lack of endorsement for the Republican party. And so um, it is definitely a conversation that is happening, but I, I also don't wanna overstate that conversation because more white evangelicals voted for Trump than they did for Mitt Romney in 2012. Um, and you would imagine that Mitt Romney was a much more palatable candidate to this population, being a fairly religious conservative, um, more orthodox in his faith and in his uh, personal life than was uh, former President Trump. And so it's it's a quite an interesting dynamic um, and, and that, We'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, Dr. Eager, there are some interesting questions in uh, the list for you. Did you have one or did you want me to throw one at um, you? I can run through them real quick. I have them up. So the first one is about how, what would you say about Biden's foreign policy background compared to Nixon? Um, I always say to my classes, I do give the Nixon administration fairly high marks on foreign policy issues, um, especially the opening to China, obviously under the Nixon administration. However, a lot of people still wonder how much of it was really Nixon versus Henry Kissinger um, <laughs> kind of directing that policy. Some people described, um, you know, Kissinger as Nixon's brain, which I don't know if that's a fair assessment either. But, um, but yeah, there are some parallels because obviously uh, Nixon was um, vice president for Eisenhower for eight years previously. And Nixon really is a moderate Republican. I mean, especially in today's viewpoint and, and Biden is very moderate Democrat in many ways, at least historically. Um, so again, we'll have to see if that kind of moderation or centrism of both Nixon and Biden will kind of serve them well um, in the foreign policy landscape. So hopefully that kind of answered that question a little bit. Um, imposing sanctions on Putin himself from Kim Duff, um, I guess he'd have to personally kill somebody. I mean, I'm not trying to be flip about it, but I don't understand either, you know, why we refuse to put sanctions on Putin. Um, certainly we could freeze assets, financial assets and things of that nature. Uh, but it's very rare when you see sanctions um, directed against a, a head of government or a head of state of another country. Um, obviously, there was a report that just came out too about the killing of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi uh, by the intelligence community in the United States. Um, and there were sanctions imposed upon some of the members around Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, but not sanctions against him, um, against the crown prince himself. Um, so that, again, you know, it's, I think, a similar parallel to why we don't see sanctions um, directly against Putin. Um, and then somebody asked about the BRI, China's Belt Road Initiative. I think the United States has no response to China's BRI. Um, I think China's BRI is ambitious. It's um, strategic. It's well-funded. <laughs> um, it involves over 60 countries now, including even some countries in Europe and Latin America that are part of the BRI. Um, so I really think this is an area where the United States is dropping the ball um, and that we have no response basically to the China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Susan Rice, um, I was surprised she didn't end up on the foreign policy side of things in the Biden administration. She's actually going to take more portfolio of domestic policy. Um, and maybe that's indicative that she might have um, aspirations to run someday herself as a candidate. Um, as far as kind of getting that domestic public policy experience under her portfolio, in addition to her wide breadth of foreign policy experience that she already possesses. Um, and I think that's about it, unless somebody else wants to jump in. 
with foreign policy questions. Somebody asked too about the WHO, the World Health Organization, which has been under a lot of criticism for years, not even just COVID-19, but even going back to the SARS pandemic or epidemic in 2003. Um, so yeah, I mean, the United States certainly has lost some bargaining power for sure, um, but the WHO is desperate to get funding back from the United States. So it'll be interesting to see how the US Chinese dynamic within the World Health Organization plays out because when, when Trump withdrew from the WHO, uh, China basically said, well, we'll make up the shortfall in funding difference that used to be contributed by the United States. Um, so, you know, China, just like the United States historically used dollar diplomacy, the Chinese can use yuan diplomacy um, and throw a lot of money around, you know, at these organizations or for these organizations. So, um, I think that'll be interesting to see in the coming, you know, next few years as far as kind of whether countries coalesce behind a U.S. leadership within the World Health Organization or behind more of a Chinese leadership, because the Chinese are also doing a lot with giving out vaccines to the world, um, especially to the poorest developing countries. And the United States is doing some of that, too. But China has been, I would say, more ambitious um, and strategic kind of in their vaccine diplomacy as well. Thank you. Dr. Tucker Works, did you want to speak to whether or not Vice President Harris will be running herself one day for the presidency, whether Biden might only serve one term? Any speculation there? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I thought that was I mean, I think that's why he chose her. That's what I'm thinking. But um, I do. I don't think. Biden is going to run for a second term, and I think she's the the most likely, um, you know, person who who might run, um, who the Democratic Party might support. But I think that depends on the next couple of years. Um, I think she has to be really out there, um, you know, a really active vice president. But I do think there's a lot of possibility for that. What do you think? <laughs> yes, I think I think the same. I think it. Uh, she will have to be careful in um, balancing the interests of the progressive wing of the party with the interests of the moderate wing of the party in order to uh, encourage people to coalesce around her, um, because there are a lot of potential candidates in four years and eight years. Um, we don't see, I don't think, as big of a bench uh, on the Republican side as we do on the Democratic side, in part because we just had a, a very vibrant um, primary in 2020. So I think that will be interesting to watch. I was going to speak to one of the questions pertaining to the future of the Republican Party, if it's if it's if there's going to be a change. I just wanted to highlight in history, we've really only seen about six instances where we've had a realignment. And that is when a, a, co a dramatic coalition is altered. Um, the Civil War is a party realignment. The Great Depression is a party realignment. Um, a pandemic, you think, might cause a realignment. Um, a, a, a presidency of, of Donald Trump's sort, it could cause a realignment, but we, we just don't see that happening in part because we, we just ha have seen such great consistency amongst the GOP loyalty. And I think, it's, I think this realignment or the, the dramatic shift in, in what the parties represent is just unlikely because of the nature of partisanship, how it has changed from just kind of something that reflected your economic interests to now something that is who you are and what you want to be and how you feel worth and, and significance in your life. And so the realignments in history, the five or six of them that are in the books, um, I, I, I don't know what it's gonna take, but it, it didn't seem to happen with the pandemic and, and you think it might. We also thought it might happen with 9-11. We thought a big terrorist attack might shift the priorities of a party. Um, it didn't. Uh, we're, we're still arguing about Dr. Seuss when, when, the, when a pandemic is barely starting to get under control. Uh, I think that that speaks to um, what the appetite is for the electorate, unfortunately. Um, I saw a question from Dr. Zaki, which I don't know if I'll try to take that on. 
Um, but she's asking about whether Trump is like Charles de Gaulle um, as far as his kind of affect and personal charisma. So Charles de Gaulle was the first president of the Fifth Republic of France. Um, and France, of course, went through a very unstable period in the Fourth Republic right after the end of World War II. So some folks even call Charles de Gaulle, who was a general previously, um, the Republican monarch. <laughs> Um, that, you know, Charles de Gaulle, very much like the pomp and circumstance and pageantry of the presidency of France. Um, and then kind of like Dr. Robinson was saying, changes in the electorate started kind of shifting as far as the 1960s generation. And by the time de Gaulle left office in like 69, he basically said, I don't recognize French society anymore. Like things had moved kind of with the women's movement and the kind of leftist movements that were really um, going on throughout Europe during that time. So de Gaulle also liked crowds. He liked rallies. <laughs> um, and of course, obviously back then we didn't have social media, um, but he was often want, want to you know, speak from balconies. I remember him speaking in Canada uh, to the Quebec separatists, basically saying long live France, you know, long live the French to the Quebec separatists. So I can certainly see some similarities in kind of the showmanship um, of Charles de Gaulle um, in comparison to President Trump. However, in my opinion, uh, Charles de Gaulle had a much more um, solid, I would say, kind of previous experience, um, both, like I said, in fighting in World War I and World War II. Um, and whether people liked him or not as a person, um, you know, a lot of people feel that he was what was needed at that time in great political instability within France. Um, so whether people feel that same way about Trump with like QAnon supporters and things like that, um, you know, obviously some of those folks feel like this is an Armageddon type moment, you know, that really um, everything is hanging in the balance and uh, see Trump as this charismatic person, you know, who can save us from ourselves. Um, so I do see, I guess, some similarities, like I said, at least in their kind of love of showmanship and kind of the theatrics of, um, you know, being the head of government of uh, powerful countries. I thought there was an interesting question from an alum uh, who asked how we're encouraging young people to gain real world experience. Um, and I think it is a challenge. And I, I wanted to hear Dr. Tucker Works if you wanted to speak to that. Sure, I was just gonna give uh, one example. I think again, it is a challenge. It's, it's really a challenge during a pandemic. <laughs> you know, when people can't really get out, you know, safely. But one of the things we're doing this semester is that students, about eight students, um, are involved in this project called the Participatory Redistricting Project. And so we, Dr. Robinson and I, are actually working together on this. And uh, we're working with an organization called the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And they are um, uh, sponsoring these workshops about drawing redistricting maps. Um, you know, in, you know, we have the census every 10 years, and so we just had one in 2020. And so students, our students are learning how to draw redistricting maps. Um, they will eventually, um, you know, uh, go and present their maps to people in the community, as well as um, present them to the state legislature and the governor. And so they'll learn, and when they're learning how to draw these maps in Maryland, we're working on a Maryland map, but um, they will learn how to, they will be able to draw maps any district, in any district in the United States. And so we're really excited about that. It's a, it's kind of like a, um, it's not a real sex, I mean, that's not the right word, but it's not like a necessarily, you know, um, what is it called? I don't know. Uh, it's a way of participating in the process um, and of engaging um, in the process, in democracy, um, that maybe we don't always think about, put it that way. And so we're, I, I'm very excited about that project. So we've been doing that this semester. And I'll just jump in here to say too, though not part of the panel, another way during a pandemic to get experience and meet folks and um, Hood alums have been really generous with their time. They've been coming into my class, uh, especially uh, Political Science 304, Philanthropy and Civic Life. Lots of uh, foundation leaders, volunteers who sit on nonprofit boards and other nonprofit professionals um, in that landscape have agreed to come in and talk to students and are really willing to connect one-on-one -on -one, um, to 
make things happen for students. So um, the generosity of the community here in Frederick and beyond as well as um, Hood alums, um, like the one that posed this question, <laughs> um, has been much appreciated, especially uh, at this time and uh, during these conditions and for me as a new instructor as well. Um, I see a question from Jonathan about what my thoughts are about William Burns. So um, as the new director of the CIA, and I think it's an interesting choice because he's his experience is from the State Department. So um, obviously, mostly CIA directors, not all the time, but sometimes come from within the intelligence community. And certainly the State Department is part of the intelligence community as well. Um, but not one that we often kind of first think of when we, when we talk about the intelligence community. Um, so obviously we know there's been an issue with politicization of the intelligence process. Um, and that some of that goes back to even pre 9-11 and certainly in the run up to the war in Iraq um, in 2003 as well. So I think it's an interesting choice. And I think it really kind of also signals from the Biden administration that um, they want to have as much as possible a nonpartisan, nonpoliticized um, CIA as well. And certainly during the Trump administration, President Trump on many occasions um, outright either denied or dismissed or undercut some of the assessments of his own intelligence community, um, which certainly understandably hurt the morale of a lot of the career bureaucrats, both also certainly within the State Department too. Um, but also within the CIA and the other um, agencies of the intelligence community. So um, again, I think it's an interesting choice. Um, and William Burns also has a lot of expertise and background in Russia and dealing with Russian affairs. Um, so hopefully that potentially could also shed some light on the newest report that just came out that Russia once again also um, made a lot of attempts to influence the 2020 election just as it had with the 2016 election as well. Okay, thank you. There was a question about if there is anything to look forward to when it comes to politics. Um, and as a political scientist, um, you know, I really do think po politics is the means to improving lives and bringing about equality and fairness and justice and things that I think we would all um, want to see more of. I think one hope I have through this pandemic is that a trust in government, a trust in government would increase, that we would see that there is a need for a central, centralized means of distribution of help, of assistance. Clearly we see a partisan divide in how mask mandates were received. Even we see a partisan divide in the confidence in vaccines. Um, but nevertheless, I think there is an acknowledgement that we, we needed to make collective action was necessary. Um, and without it, this could have been even more catastrophic. And so um, am I am I looking forward to it? Am I optimistic that there might be more trust in government? I, I'm not quite sure, but I think this is a good conversation. And, and in the aftermath of the pandemic, hopefully there's some evidence that points to the worth in government that we can all rally around and there's less partisanship in response to, to the need for politics and for government. And one other thing I wanted to say earlier when, when Dr. Tucker Works highlighted um, that we should vote how we want the world to be. Uh, if, if you are not voting, if you're apolitical, that, it, that is still a political act because you are essentially saying the status quo is good enough um, and you are endorsing the con, con, whatever is existing, you're endorsing it. And so um, as I speak to young people and my students and my kids, um, we are political beings and we are meant to pursue good things for ourselves and others. And so um, just a call to vote, but also the idea that you are somehow immune or outside of, of our political context is, is not accurate. We're all doing something. We're all either endorsing, we're, we're endorsing one thing or the other. I, I agree. I mean, I think I think that we I agree with what, what Dr. Robinson said about um, 
things to be hopeful about. And even seeing people still voting and protesting and demonstrating and organizing during a pandemic has given me a lot of hope um, that it, it's there, you know, so, um, and engaging. And I just taught about Ella Baker earlier today, whose um, concept, participatory democracy, you know, is all about this. It's about, it's not that voting isn't enough and, and that the, the, the power should come from the grassroots and the people and engaging. And so I think all of those things are, are give me hope. And I, I just think we're, there is a new generation that's coming up who they were wearing masks when they were four or five, six years old. And um, they were waiting for the government to give them information and they were waiting for the government to help provide a vaccine. I think we, we speak of generations. We think of the World War II generations, generation. We think of, of Great Depression and the civil rights movement. And, and I think this has shaped people. I think many here tonight um, we're too old to be shaped that dramatically by this, sadly. Our formative years are, are waning, but for young people, um, I, I look at my own and I just see conversations about Black Lives Matter that I wasn't having as a six-year-old, as a white girl growing up in, in Wisconsin. Um, and so I think there's going to be a new set of variables for this generation that um, will be hopefully formative in, in the way that will bring about a greater interest and engagement with uh, society and um, and the government. And again, I mean, this is not my area of expertise as the other panelists know, um, but I would just say, I mean, it's been a hard conversation for me with my own son who's 13 years old. And as we watched the events unfold on January 6th, and I, I literally was crying that day, I'm not going to lie. Um, he said, well, is this worse than 9-11, mom? You know, and he was born in 2007. So, I mean, what he knows about 9-11 is kind of what I've taught him about 9-11, you know, what he's learned a little bit in his classes and stuff like that. And I wish I had answers, you know, for him. And, and I kind of said, yeah, Cameron, I think this is actually worse, because to me, it doesn't seem um, like there is much common ground um, that's being found. Now, on the other side, you know, from what little bit I read about American politics, some people are saying, well, a lot of U.S. folks at least have more faith and trust in their local or state governments, you know, so even if they feel the national political system and governmental structure is dysfunctional, gridlocked, whatever, that a lot of folks, both you know, committed Republicans and Democrats, have you know a great deal of trust, or at least a higher level of confidence, in their local and state elected officials. So I think that is something promising that um, we shouldn't lose sight of. And hopefully, as Dr. Robinson said, young folks like yourself um, that are in this webinar today, even if you might not run for national office right away, um, we need you to be engaged also at your local and state level of politics as well. So on that note of hopefully hope and a call to action, um, I think most of our questions have been answered. Do you agree with me panelists, esteemed colleagues? Um, then I know all of our attendees are gonna join me in giving you a wonderful round of um, applause and appreciation of your comments on what has and hasn't changed um, during uh, pre and post election um, as we all try to figure this out together going forward. I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us for this special um, event through the political science department at Hood College. And I would encourage you to keep in touch and um, I, we will be having another event uh, coming up as part of the race politics and public policy series. Um, and that will be on April 7th. Um, and so please keep an eye out uh, on your email for that, the invitation to that event. It plans, it promises to be a wonderful um, uh, uh, event for students and the community. So um, keep your eye out for that and keep in touch with that. I will thank everyone on this Zoom and wish that you all have a good night.